quaternions and not say anything else. I get this question asked all the time. Here was the question asked by a fellow named Tor on YouTube back in February. Doug Sweetser, sorry for not replying in a while. I've been absorbed by space-time algebra, which, believe it or not, has convinced me that complex quaternions are not that stupid after all. The imaginary unit is a consequence of constructing bivectors out of orthonormal unit vectors, such bivectors, which are uniquely uh, to different plane orientations, satisfy the equation v squared equals minus 1, like the imaginary unit. Why don't you like complex quaternions? Hi, Tor. I created my reply in June, like four months later, <laughs> so I am even slower. I was working on explaining my physics insights to a general audience, people in my Unitarian Universalist church. That detour was most excellent because it forced me to put into simple terms ideas that must be simple because I was describing SIN, which is an acronym for the simplest shit in nature. I would never say that complex quaternions were a stupid approach to take to modern physics. There is a collection of technical books and papers one could start with and work out from there. Understanding physics is like appreciating sculpture. There's a value at looking at things from different directions. Now, given that statement, shouldn't I take my own advice and work with complex quaternions? One belief I have is that someday in the future there will be but one way to do all of physics. I say this because nature appears to have one set of rules that we do not fully understand. Each researcher needs to make their own strategic bet about which approach they think will be best in the long run. You are betting some amount of effort on complex quaternions. I congratulate you. Most stick to tensors without even questioning their assumptions. I can give specific reasons why I have chosen not to work with complex quaternions. Let's start, though, with a physics principle and see if that has consequences to the math tools one chooses to use. I have a deep respect for Professor Leonard Susskind, a world-class theorist who's trying to reach out to sincere folks like you and me that are not world-class theore theoretical physicists. You know, in this book, I say... The theoretical minimum, what you need to know to start doing physics, uh, by Suskin and George Habrovsky. The first lecture is on the nature of classical physics. The first idea he talks about in depth deals with reversibility. So let me read from the good book, page 9. All right. Every state has a single unique arrow leading into it and a single arrow leading out of it. And then it is a legally deterministic reversible law. Here's a slogan. There must be one arrow to tell you where you're going and one arrow to tell you where you have come from. The rule that dynamical laws must be deterministic and reversible is so central to classical physics that we sometimes forget to mention it when teaching the subject. In fact, that doesn't even have a name. We could call it the first law, but unfortunately there are already two first laws, Newton's and the first law of thermodynamics. There is even a zeroth law of thermodynamics. So, if we have to get back to a 
minus first law to gain priority for what is undoubtedly the most fundamental of all physical laws, the conservation of information. The conservation of information is simply that every state has one arrow in and one arrow out. It ensures that you never lose track of where you started. End quote. The two most basic tools in the math drawer are addition and multiplication. So let's begin with the addition operator. Good old plus. And, and let's do a simple math problem. Let's do 2 plus 4 equals 6. And let's draw the graph theory for this. So we start with a node 2 as a circle, and we end up at a node 6. And then we have an arrow going from one to the other. And on that edge, we write a 4. Great. Now, how does one go backwards? The starting node is 6, the ending node is 2, and so if we add 4, oh no, we'd end up with 10. That'd be bad. So we have to add the additive inverse minus 4. Great. Let's repeat the process for multiplication. So to go, let's write it over here from 2 to the ending node 6, and we need here a 3. And to go in reverse, you have to multiply by the multiplicative inverse, which is 1 -third. Great. So, this example used real numbers. Real numbers have been there from day one of the birth of modern physics. The mathematicians had a really nasty battle over complex numbers, which have uh, the property of a division algebra, meaning a multiplicative inverse always exists. While Newton was aware of complex numbers, those numbers only took a central part stage when we developed quantum mechanics. The next step in the progression of division algebras are the quaternions. Now these days, even though I own quaternions.com, I prefer to relabel them as space-time numbers. My training in Python says names are of topmost importance. A quaternion is for Roman soldiers, and that only suggests something about numerology with a focus on four. This may actually create more problems than it solves. Yes, quaternions can be represented using four numbers or symbols. I do it all the time. But it is essential to always remember that a quaternion, or a space-time number, is one number that travels together with its structure. Space-time numbers claim by their name alone to be the numbers to use in Minkowski space-time. I always know physically what a quaternion is in space-time. It's an event in space-time. Mathematicians know what complex numbers are and know how to use them in exquisite detail. Mathematical physicists should demand to know what they mean physically because that's the physics parts of mathematical physics. 
if you don't know what a complex number is physically, then a consequence is that physical understanding will be elusive. Write a four vector. We'll make them simple. P mu equals one, two, three, four, which can be added or subtracted to another one. We'll call it Q. And we'll go four, three, two, one. And the result of P adding them together is rather simple. Nothing particularly hard about all that stuff. Both live in Minkowski space time. The exact same statement holds for space time numbers, but without any Greek letters. This isn't working so well. And we call these automorphisms because they all ha start with the same structure, either four vectors or space-time numbers, and they all end in the same structure. Now, four vectors can be multiplied by a scalar, say a five. What? Hold on a second. What is that five? Well, it's not, doesn't have the same structure. And that bothers me because you can't pick out a number out of nothing. There are no fives floating out in the vacuum of space to use as you wish. Just as with the addition operator, the five should live in the same space as a four vector. At least I think so. And so I really think of this as being like so. And then, of course, S times P will equal a simple result. Now, with space-time numbers, I have a precise idea that about what this means physically. A scalar is a space-time number that is only about time either more or less of it, and the space terms are all zero, or literally here, where the observer is in space. So, yeah, 5 times p is, 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 is that result, 5, 10, 15, 20. What multiplying the scalar 5 space-time number times p says is that the resulting event is 5 times longer and five times more distance in every non-zero direction than the event P. This result with space-time numbers is indistinguishable, actually, from taking that four vector P mu and multiplying by a scalar five. I can multiply any and all events in space-time together so long as one of them has space values that are equal to three zeros. Well, that doesn't sound so good. <laughs> so now there is a problem with the mathematician's claim that they can multiply by a scalar. Not mathematically, they get to do whatever they define as legal. It, but in a different reference frame, the values of five zero 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 can and will change. That's relativistic physics. So we would get an S prime, and then S prime times P will not equal this one, but it will be defined. The zeros 
will become non-zero depending on the motion of the observer. That is not a problem for space-time numbers where all values can be non-zero and multiplication just works. What mathematicians are requiring by saying that a four vector p mu must be multiplied by a scalar is that one has to work in one reference frame where the spatial terms are equal to zero. I doubt physicists will like that. Why are mathematicians satisfied with their definition of four vectors? Because it's easy to extend to 5, 10, or 11 dimensions. Mathematicians love to play in higher dimensional space. But for space-time problems, or physics problems, I don't care about 5, 10, or 11 dimensions. The universe I collect data in has three spatial dimensions and one time dimension. Could I make a video just like this one that puts down space-time numbers? Well, I certainly could put one up that would say, I haven't done most of physics because physics is a huge topic. Uh, but I haven't seen a technical hurdle that if I focused on it for long enough, I couldn't resolve. Now, if you disagree with that, please make a video or email me a, with your concern about its limitations. Thank you very much.